Julian Fellows is the creator, writer, and executive producer of The Gilded Age on HBO. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Julian, this series has been in development for a very long time, and it's finally arrived on HBO. So I wanted to ask you about, about the process. What first excited you about this period of history when you started developing the series? And as you were going along and um, exploring it over the years, what emerged for you as really exciting as well? Well, I got interested in the, in the Gilded Age a long time before. I was thinking of it in terms of a TV show. Uh, I just was reading around this particular uh, subject and this period in American history, essentially between the Civil War and the First World War. And it was a period of extraordinary growth uh, and obviously tremendous financial activity and these enormous fortunes, railways and oil and copper, and you name it, uh, and shipping and so on. Um, but it, it was also the way America developed as a society uh, in those years. What had happened before the, the Civil War, uh, the American upper classes were on the whole living a, a kind of version of the European way of doing it. Uh, and they were essentially, uh, the leaders were mainly drawn from gentry families of, of the Netherlands and Scotland and England and so on. Uh, and, and so that rather quiet sort of genteel life of Washington Square and everything were, was quite restrained. And it wasn't really very American. It was just the way it had been done for hundreds of years. But because of these enormous fortunes, elevating people who were not from that background, who had come over uh, and came from more humble backgrounds originally, historically, for the most part, uh, they wanted to do it their own way. They wanted a new way. They wanted an American way. Uh, and they started building their palaces and making their collections and all the rest of it. And they didn't want that discreet, everyone sitting in a circle in a drawing room in Washington Square. That wasn't for them. And what I see it as was a kind of limbering up of the country, uh, a, a sense rather like someone growing up when you start to feel your own strength and, and a, a, you know, a woman starts to understand that she's beautiful or a man starts to understand that he's strong or whatever. And that was really the process that America was going through as a civilization. And of course, in hindsight, one can say it was a preparation for the century they would dominate because the 20th century would essentially belong to America. Uh, and that was only, uh, you know, uh, less than 20 years after, uh, I mean, 30 years after the period I'm dealing with, when their voice at the end of the First World War would be the loudest voice, even though they'd only been in the war for not much more than a year. Nevertheless, President Wilson was calling the shots within a very short time over the emperors of Austria and Germany and these ancient uh, monarchies and everything. The American president's voice was the loudest. And, uh, and that in itself fascinates me as the development of this country turning into a world power, or at least, recognizing that it was already a world power. Uh, and uh, you know, I think it's a very interesting thing to trace. And then the more I sort of got into it, um, the more I realized that it was a period very much dominated by women. I mean, on the whole, the history of society, if one extracts uh, warfare and politics to a degree, although women had a, a big influence over politics long before they had the vote, which of course seems ironic, but is nevertheless true. Um, but social stuff on both sides of the Atlantic was run by women. And these women, the American version, were very, very strong characters. I mean, this is in real life, Mrs. Vanderbilt, Mrs. Astor, the, Mrs. Ulrichs, you know, these, these were tough days. And, uh, and that in itself, you know, the more I studied it and the more I read these books, the more I came really 
to sort of see that it had lots of echoes for now, for things that uh, rather interest us now. Uh, and it gradually, in my head, through a sort of a process of osmosis, turned into a TV show. And that was when uh, I met, uh, or I think I knew, uh, Bob Greenblatt, who was then at NBC Universal. And we'd nearly worked together on something similar but different earlier on, which never got going. Uh, and we decided to develop this, and we did. Uh, and then he, he left NBC Universal and went to HBO uh, and took us with him. So um, that was, you know, very encouraging, really. Uh, but, but everything was complicated by COVID, you know, the arrival of COVID. And we, we had, in fact, we were, I forget now, but we were about two weeks from shooting when they suddenly came in and shut us down. And we were on the dawn flight the following morning back to London. And of course, I thought that would probably be curtains for the whole thing, because you know how timing is everything. But it wasn't. And they decided some months later, I mean, about six months, eight months later, uh, to return to the, the um, pre-production. And then we got going. And then we had the complications of filming in COVID with its bracelets and masks and visors and testing without end, you know. Um, but anyway, we, we did it and we got there and, and, um, and I was pleased with the result. I thought we managed to get a fantastic cast. And uh, of course, partly because of COVID, uh, our, pretty well our whole supporting cast came from Broadway. Uh, and we had, I think, seven or eight Tony winners uh, in the end. So, you know, that was a great plus. So it's an ill wind, as they say, that there's nobody any good. Yeah, uh, it's an absolutely remarkable cast. Uh, but I want to ask you about um, the episode that you're submitting uh, for writing uh, at the Emmys for consideration, which is Face the Music, the third episode. Um, it's such a remarkable piece early on because I think it's a real turning point in the series, at least for me, in, in seeing who these characters really are. Um, but I wanted to start by asking you, you know, what do you love about that episode and what are you most proud of uh, about that episode in particular? Well, I think I, I always wanted, I was rather drawn to the character of Jay Gould in real life because he was this strange combination of a man who was very ruthless. I mean, famously ruthless, even among ruthless men. Uh, and uh, that was his reputation. But at the same time, he was very affectionate father and husband. Uh, and there's something in that dichotomy that I find very appealing of human beings' ability to kind of shut off, compartmentalize themselves. Everyone is always complaining about being compartmentalized, but the truth is we do it to ourselves. That is, in a sense, George Russell, although actually um, the, the bit of business in uh, this particular episode, uh, in fact, happened to Commodore Vanderbilt when uh, the sort of ancients of of, you know, the, um, what do you call them, the, the alderman, uh, ganged up against him and tried to get the better of him. Uh, and of course, you'd have to get up very early in the morning to get the better of Commodore Vanderbilt. Uh, and he decided to teach them a lesson once and for all. He, he, he risked an enormous amount of money uh, in order to do it, more money than they had believed he had it in, in, at his disposal, but he did, uh, and he ruined them. I mean, they. I, I don't. I, I. As I hope we show in the in the in the episode, I have some sympathy for them, but not much, because they were trying to trick him out of the money. They were undoing their own laws and redoing them, and driving up and pushing down and selling short and all of these tricks which you may give labels to, but are nevertheless, you know, these, this is the behavior of gangsters, really. And uh, he decided to uh, pay, the, you know, teach them a lesson uh, with one or two very tragic outcomes. 
Um, but, you know, they didn't do it again. And I don't think they would do it again to George Russell. So, uh, but, but I also wanted just to remind the audience, I suppose, uh, that these games have big stakes. And, uh, you know, it's, although in a TV show, we can make them seem quite amusing sometimes and, and, and quite involving, and the women are so pretty and the clothes are so lovely and everything. But I just wanted to, to remind them that there is a darker side to all this stuff. Uh, and uh, there is, and there is today. Uh, and uh, that seemed to be something worth saying, really. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that is what is so striking about it is we really see for the first time just how ruthless uh, the Russells can be. Um, one of the other things I love about the episode is it really is our first look at Peggy as a professional writer um, and some of the struggles that she faces. What I love about um, Peggy as a character is it really opens up for the show uh, and for you and, and the writers, uh, Sonia Warfield, looking at this kind of underrepresented part of history, which is the Black elite in Brooklyn. So I just wanted to ask you about, you know, leaning into that opportunity to kind of shine a light on, you know, a history that a lot of people don't know much about. Yes, I think because the sort of narrative uh, of Black history at the moment uh, is very much concentrated on the injustice they were subjected to. And of course, you know, before the injustice of ordinary racism, we have the supreme injustice of slavery, all of which uh, is in very high relief just now. And I, you know, I agree with all that, but I also think there is benefit in knowing that there is a, a black history in this country that isn't all that, that there were these successful people. There was a different, a part of the economy. Brooklyn was a different and prosperous place. It's all before Harlem, which was essentially a post-First World War phenomenon. Uh, and these people existed. I read a book by Carla Peterson about her own family, which she traces, called A Black Gotham. And it's about the kind of black bourgeoisie of the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and I found that interesting because there were opportunities. I mean, Peggy uh, is uh, educated at the uh, Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia, completely real establishment, uh, which is now a university, but was a, a school then. Uh, and that was the top school uh, of the black community, but a very good school. And, uh, you know, there was a black elite that could take advantage of these things. Also, which I found a very interesting detail, and you should talk to Sonia about this, uh, the whole thing of the black newspapers that were uh, very much part of that society, that not all the news was coming from white sources and showing only the white point of view and the white angle. There was uh, a heavily subscribed uh, black uh, newspaper culture uh, and uh, the globe, which we, we use in this, and we're also going to use another newspaper, uh, were real newspaper, real publications. Thomas Fortune is a real man uh, who did a great deal of good, actually. Um, and uh, I, we also touch on, uh, in the next series, uh, Booker T. Washington, who's another very distinguished black activist reformer, but with a different agenda from Fortune's, which in itself I found quite interesting that they were pursuing different goals. Um, and, but there were, and there also were, pub, I mean, very few, but there were published black female novelists. Uh, I mean, I think one should remember that uh, there are certain things that run between the communities. And the fact is writing was one of the very few careers that was allowed to women. That, uh, you know, going quite far back, uh, certainly to the beginning of the 19th century uh, and beyond, really, it was accepted that women could be good writers uh, and uh, they could be published. Of course, most of the famous ones, Jane Austen or, you know, the Brontes or whatever, uh, were all white, but there were black women novelists at this time. And so we're not inventing a career for Peggy. We're taking a minority career, but we're 
giving her a career that other black women were pushing for at that time, uh, and, and which all of which I think gives us a dimension that is useful and productive. That's what I, but at the same time, we're very careful to have reminders of the fact that this was a racist society. We may be taking a slightly different angle on it, but there was a kind of casual racism that would outlast this period, I'm sorry to say, uh, and you know, be with us probably today, but certainly pretty recently. But just that ordinary thing you have to live with every day. When we have, you know, Peggy's talking to her father and they notice that a white couple has stopped and they have to go to one side to let them pass. And there's a moment when pa Peggy says, you know, uh, it's worse down here when they're in the South, it's worse. But, you know, it's not perfect for us. We're living with this every day. And I can't be expected to have a major fight every time I come up against it, because otherwise I wouldn't be doing anything else. Uh, and I hope we remind our audience of what the black community were having to deal with on a daily, hourly basis alongside the, the slightly broader life that was available, at least to a chunk of them, uh, which I hope we're bringing to the public notice, really. Right. And before I let you go, you hinted at this earlier, some of the historical figures you'll introduce in, in the next season. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, is there anything you can tease about season two for us? Because it is back in production as of this week or last week, which is very exciting. So is there anything you can share with us uh, ahead of season two? No, really. <laughs> I'm never supposed to talk about anything really like that. I've probably already broken the bounds, but um, you know, we, we continue. I mean, we've set uh, a, a style for ourselves now of bringing in real life events and winding our characters into them so that there is a sense of what was going on in New York, in Newport uh, at that time. And I, I hope um, we give a kind of ordinariness to events that then our viewers can look up on Wikipedia and see we didn't make them up, you know, they, they were real. I mean, um, like Edison lighting up Park Row, you know, for that great demonstration, that was all 100% true. And it was an extraordinary variegated audience that gathered together to see it. And they had, you know, great diversity of who was there and the rich in their carriages and street walkers and everything. They, they all wanted to see it. And uh, when I was reading about it, I thought this is such a good moment for us because we can have anyone we want here to see it. Uh, of our characters and, and step, remain truthful. And so, uh, you know, I like that. I hope we've found a couple more of those incidents uh, in, in our second series. But as to what they are, I guess you're just gonna have to wait and see. Julian, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Congratulations on the first season of The Gilded Age and thanks for talking to Gold Derby. It was very nice of you to ask me, thank you. <laughs>